Welcome everybody. We are so glad to have you with us this morning for another one of our virtual animal meet and greets. Thank you all so much for joining us. To view live closed captions for this program in English and Spanish, please click the link that we're going to drop into the chat. My name is Rachel and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum. As you can probably tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you but we do have some amazing staff that are still going into the museum to help take care of all the living animals that call the museum home. Now, some people are surprised to learn that the museum even has live animals, but we do have over a hundred different species of living animals that are in places like our nature lab, the new Bugtopia exhibit in the Discovery Center, and some that live behind the scenes. So if you'd like, use this opportunity to grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts that you've learned, or draw or write a description of what the animals we're meeting today look like. So let's get started. I'm going to switch our camera over to Leslie so we can meet our live animals today, and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hey, Leslie. Hi, everybody. I am so happy to be with you all today. Go, I'm trying to make sure I can see myself. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know where I went. Anyway, really happy to be with you all today. I've got two wonderful animals with me uh, to share with you today. Now, they have the same name, basically, but they are radically different animals. <clears throat> I've got two skinks today. Skinks, that's a fun word, right? <clears throat> We've got a Solomon Island skink. Her name is Tallulah. Can you guys see her down here? She's sitting down here on the tree waiting for a snack. And we're also going to be sharing with you another skink. Let me show you their headshots here real quick. We've got two pictures of what they look like up close. This is Tallulah's cute little face. I love these lizards. They are so special and so unique. They're called Solomon Island or monkey-tailed skinks or prehensile-tailed skinks. Animals have a lot of names sometimes. And the next animal we're gonna meet is called a Western skink. What a little cutie, right? We're gonna be meeting him a little bit later. Uh, they also have another name, Skilton skink. So lots of different names. You know, we're gonna be looking at these guys today to try to understand the word diversity. Diversity in the natural world means differences. That's all. And it's a good thing. It makes the natural world more beautiful. It makes it stronger. I feel the same way about the human world. So when we try to understand them, we want to look closely at their little lives. You know, there's 4,000 species of lizards out there. And some people might say, eh, lizards are all the same, but they're not. Not a lot of people spend time looking at individual little lizard lives, but I do. I love them. And there's lots of groupings of lizards, okay? So you might be asking me, what is a skink anyway? I can see that it's a lizard, but what's a skink? It's a family of lizards. Like iguanas are a family, geckos are a family, skinks are a family called skinkidae. My son laughs at that one. Skinkidae, and there's about a thousand skinks around the world, okay? Now, um, skinks have some things in common. That's why they're put into a little group together called a family. Let's look at the California skinks together. I want to see what you notice about their bodies. What do you notice? Do you notice they have long, slinky little bodies? Do you notice they have really smooth scales? How about their legs? A lot of them have teeny weeny little legs. A lot of them are small. They even have a little shovel like head and all of this is for a good reason because they are many times fossorial. Fossorial meaning, where do you find fossils? Underground usually. Fossorial means they're often found underground. Now you might've noticed some of those had a very bright coloration to them. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, but there are even some skinks out there that are so extreme, they hardly even look like skinks anymore. They look almost like snakes. 
They're very extreme little skinks. Look at those guys. The one on the left, look at those silly legs. There's hardly any legs there at all. What good does that do? <laughs> well, I tell you, it doesn't do them a lot of good up on the ground, but it probably helps to be underground to have teeny little legs. They don't get in the way. And the skink on the right looks like a worm, right? I mean, there's no ears that you can see. That's usually one way you can tell a lizard from a snake, for example. There's no eyes that you can see. In fact, this animal is blind. It can't see. It's got little spots, but there's no eyes. So you might say to me, Leslie, well, how do we even know that's not a worm? How do we know it's a skink? Okay, so scientists will look at more than external features. Sometimes they look at the bones to put animals into groups of, of similar types. Okay, so the, these bones have some similarities. The one on the left is the skull of the Western skink we're gonna meet. And the one on the right is the skull of the Solomon Island skink, Tallulah. Now notice the teeth, okay? That's one thing I'm gonna talk about. See how they both have very sharp teeth? There's some other similarities in the way the bones are shaped. But you know, a lot of people might look at those teeth and say, um, they must be carnivores, all of them, because they have sharp teeth. Well, you actually have to look at an animal's whole life to really understand it. Uh, let's look at their habitats. The habitats of these two skinks. On the left, the beautiful, the lush, the green Solomon Islands. Uh, looks like a jungle, right? It's tropical. And on the right, the beautiful, the rocky, the tan, Southern California. So two different habitats and they live in different places in those habitats. The Solomon Island skinks, Tallulah here, lives up high in the trees. That means she's arboreal, arboreal. And remember I said fossorial for the Western skinks, they live down among those rocks and leaves. Isn't that cool? So you notice that Tallulah here, let's go back to her. She doesn't exactly look like some of those skinks I showed you in the picture. Let's see if I can get her a little closer to you. She's got a slightly different body. And again, that's because she has a really different life, all right? She's got different needs and a different body and a different life. I'm gonna give her a little snack. Now, I wanna show you something really cool about a lot of lizards. Um, if this next picture is what it would look like if the Western skink was walking through the grass. You can see it very, very clearly, can't you? And you might say to me, Leslie, why is it so bright? It's gonna get eaten by a predator. The predator's gonna see him. And yes, you're right. And that's what the lizard wants. They actually want to be seen in this case. Many of the Western skinks have this bright blue tail for a reason. Now, this is cool. There's something about lizard tails that you might know that they can do that's special with them. See, they have a trick up their sleeve or a trick up their pant leg, as it were. <laughs> what is it that lizards can do that's special? with their tails. Does anybody know? They can drop them. Now don't freak out, okay? I'm gonna show you a picture of what it looks like when they drop their tails. It's called caudal autotomy. That's a funny word for dropping their tails, all right? Ooh, somebody said they grow back. Absolutely, they can grow back. This is so cool. Are you ready to see the video? Let's go for it. It looks weird, it looks different, okay? but. It's okay, the lizard is not hurt. And you can't take your eyes off it, can you? <laughs> That's what the lizard wants. The lizard wants you to see that tail, right? Do you see the lizard? No, because the lizard got out of there as fast as it could. <laughs> so, that's a really cool thing about them. They use their behavior to hide themselves. Okay, we can end that video. They hide themselves by being fast by getting out of there. They wanna drop their tail, and we can come back to me if you'd like. They drop their tail so that they can get out of there and hide. This cryptic behavior, cryptic meaning the ability to hide, is to be fast, okay? So they have this tail that flops around, and again, they can do this on purpose. Let's be lizards together, okay? And what it is is like a, it's like a glove, and fingers in the glove. These are muscles, and this is cartilage that holds the tail on. Cartilage is like what you have in your nose. So what happens is, here I am being a lizard. When I get scared, 
say I saw a predator, and it touches me, say, with its paw or its nose, I let go, and the tail flops away like crazy. Can you do that with me? We're whole lizards, okay? We're holding on to our tail. Along comes a coyote, <laughs> and we, we hear it, we're scared, and it touches us. We let go and flop away like crazy. That's what it wants. It wants you, to, you, the predator, to see that tail, maybe get a snack, and the lizard gets out of there. Isn't that cool? Now, Tallulah, the skink here, the, the Solomon Island skink, she can't do that. She needs her tail in a different way. She also uses it with her cryptic behavior. Let's look at a picture of what it looks like in her arboreal life. She's up there holding on with that tail. Can you see her pencil tail? Oh, and, and she's holding on tightly with it. It's like an extra hand. So if she were to drop that tail, <laughs> from high up in the treetops, you can come back to me now, that tail would go swirling down to the ground and the predator would be like, nice trick. Where, why did you just let go of your tail? It wouldn't do her any good. She really needs that tail when she's trying to hold on. And that's actually what she's doing right now. She's holding on to this branch down here. Okay, so that tail is important to her because she's up in the trees. Really different lives, right? They're both called snakes, but they have pretty different lives so far, as you can see. Now, uh, while they're up there looking for food, what is it they're gonna look for, all right? They're both gonna be doing tongue flicking as they move around in their world. I think you've probably seen Tallulah do this a couple times. They tongue flick like snakes do. You know, stinks are often mistaken for snakes, there's a reason for that. They're very closely related. They're like siblings in a way, okay? Very closely related. So they do flick their tongue to smell and taste just like snakes do. Now I'm gonna see Justine is in the back with Blue the Western skink, who's one of our neighbors in Southern California. I wonder if Blue's awake. Justine, is he awake? Cause I brought a video if he's not. So he is awake moving around quite a bit <laughs> you guys might be able to see him he's over here in this corner digging around um like leslie mentioned he is fossorial so he's been burrowing around in the substrate i'm assuming trying to find there he is trying oh, there to get some lunch that he'll be getting in the, in a minute <laughs> that's awesome, awesome. If you guys watch him closely, you might get to see a cute little pink tongue. Yeah. You know, see, why don't we show that video anyway? Why don't we just show that little tongue flicking video so you can see him hopping around? This is what greets us every single morning when, when we walk in and Blue's excited. Keep an eye out for him. He's in there somewhere. And there he is. <laughs> da, 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 da. There's our little dragon. Look at his little tongue. Oh, he's so cute. He's going to pop up again in a second. I'll put this video up on our Instagram later so you guys can watch it again. But this next picture just kind of gives you an idea of what you're about to see them eating, okay? Remember, we've got this Western skink on the left with the fossorial lifestyle, underground lifestyle. So what's he gonna find on the ground and under the dirt to eat? Bugs. So yeah, he uses those sharp teeth to crunch on bugs, spiders, pill bugs, sow bugs. And a lot of people assume that uh, herbivores don't need teeth, but in fact, Tallulah, the Solomon Island skink, is an herbivore, and she does need her teeth. See that middle picture? She might reach up very high for a flower or a leaf. How's she going to get it down? Does she have a pair of scissors? No, she does not. <laughs> she has to uh, use her teeth to tear them down. Uh, all right, so let's come back to me, and I want to show you kind of what a little bit of her life is like. She's going to crawl through the trees. You guys can crawl with me very slow. Remember, she's slow, and she's going to tongue flick like that, okay, looking for her food, and she will use her sharp teeth to tear. In fact, I'm going to see if I can get her to take a little nibble here and show you the bite marks. It's awfully cute. Oh, yeah, yeah, she's making little holes. Oh, finished taking a bite there, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll give it back to you in a second. But 
you can see the little bite marks, the little tears from her sharp teeth. So that's how she's going to do it. Now, Justine, tell us a little bit about how blue the skink eats here in our um, museum in each morning, or not each morning, he eats a couple times a week. Tell us about it, Justine. So here at the museum, he has quite the palace behind the scenes. If you guys can see my tongs, this is his house right here over my shoulder. But because he's so small, today we put him in this feeding aquarium so that you guys could get a better look at him. But when he's in that big giant enclosure and buried underneath the substrate, as you guys see, he blends in pretty well, so it's hard to find him. So what we've started doing with him is when we're ready to feed, we'll just scratch our fingers on the handles of his doors, and that alerts him that it's time to pop out of the substrate and eat. So what I'm going to do right now is try to offer him some food. I'm going to try and do it right in front of this rock that's in the corner. I'm gonna give it a little scratch and then I'm gonna offer him a mealworm. And I have a pretty strong suspicion that he's gonna take it, but we'll see. So watch really closely because it's gonna happen really quick. <laughs> he's our little dragon. Oh, he got it. <laughs> he's so cute. I'm gonna put a video of that on our Instagram as well. Uh, I hope you enjoyed looking at these two little lives a little bit more closely. You know, all lizards and all animals have different lives and you really have to, to look closely to understand them. Um, so I'm gonna take any questions now, Justine and I will both take questions uh, if you guys have any, but thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much to Leslie and Justine and to Lula and Blue. <laughs> this is awesome. I've loved seeing our lizards and skinks. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of student questions. I'm going to jump right into them. Um, a couple folks um, were curious, Ruthie, Masa, and Freya were wondering, how long does it take for a tail to grow back? Oh, thank you for saying that because I just realized I forgot to tell you something important. They can't do that over and over and over again. So that tail might grow back. Um, once, maybe twice, depending on where they let it go, but they can't do it over and over. It's their get out of jail free card. It saves their life one time, basically. So please don't ever do this to a lizard on purpose. You can watch videos of it online, okay? But it might take a couple of months, depending on the nutrition, how much food they're getting to really regrow, but it regrows with cartilage, not bone. Cool, right? It starts out with bone and then regrows as cartilage. Wow, that's a pretty cool defensive strategy that these animals have. Do you imagine being able to drop off your arm if it gets stuck in a something in a ring? <laughs> Can you just drop it off and grow another one? <laughs> that could be pretty cool. <laughs> um, Sophia is curious, and I see you're giving Lulu a little snack right now. What is Tallulah's favorite snack? She loves her legumes. <laughs> she really loves green beans. Uh, I've also got some okra here. Um, you know, flowers, leaves, and, and sometimes fruit is generally what they eat. But, you know, when we bring her out to meet with people, she gets her favorites. Love that. Green beans are some of my favorite foods, too. Uh, Eliana was curious, why are they called skinks? And would we find a skink in a city like Los Angeles? Absolutely. Um, you know, the name they were given is their family name, Skinkaday. You know, humans have a family name too, Homo sapiens. Well, actually we are, that's our species name. You know, <laughs> anyway, Canaday, for example, is the name for dogs and dog-like animals. So it's these names that scientists come up with. Why they picked it, I don't know, but um, all skinks have these similar features and they fit in that category. Um, Justine, you wanna tell us a little bit about where they're found? So blue here is a native skink to our area. Um, the Western skinks are actually found all the way up into British Columbia in Canada, and then all the way down to Baja, California, all along the West Coast. Um, so he is definitely one you may find in this area. Um, I know my old uh, house that I grew up in, in Glendora, we had these guys all the time, um, especially like we find them out and about in the summertime. Uh, so this is one you guys definitely would find 
in this area if you're out in nature. You can see these though. <laughs> like I said, these are from the Solomon Islands and they are actually the biggest skink in the world, the largest skink in the world. She's a little bit smaller than some, um, but this is, most of them are pretty small and they do tend to hide in the, in the leaf litter, but there's a few big juicy bellies like this. Leslie, could you tell us, Leanne was curious, where are the Solomon Islands? Yeah, that is um, a common question too. They're off the coast of New Guinea. Um, in a minute, maybe uh, I, I did include a slide way down below, Lindsay, if you wanna try to share that one way below, but it's, it's off the coast of New Guinea, small set of islands. Very special, very special place. Absolutely. Oh yeah, Lindsay's gonna pull up our map. All right, yeah, near Australia, see that? Very cool. With lots of great trees for our arboreal oh, yeah. critters oh, yeah. to <laughs> survive in. Um, Salwa and Malika were curious, uh, what predators do these animals have? They were curious specifically about birds. Do birds eat these animals? Oh yes, birds eat anything they can catch a lot of times. Uh, up in the high trees of the Solomon Islands, it might be um, a fishing eagle up there that would take them. Um, they're quite large. So that's one of the reasons why being up in the tree and moving slow and then freezing when danger comes is a really important thing for them, right? So we have these two strategies. You guys can do it with me at home, going slow, freezing. And then the other one, yes, any kind of bird, coyote, uh, the little guys, right? Birds, coyotes, bobcats, just about any predator would eat them. And their response, what is it again? What is it again? Crazy. <laughs> awesome. Um, we have a couple of students that are curious about, um, let's see, if they, if they bite and or if they are venomous. Um, Alexander Martin and some students from Eastman were curious about that. These ones are not venomous and there aren't very many lizards that are, they do exist, um, but these ones are not. And yes, every animal can bite. Everything with a mouth can bite, right? Animals bite when they are, think about it. Why do dogs bite? Why do cats bite? usually bite when they're scared. We always seem to know that about dogs, but we forget that applies to every other animal too, when they're scared. The other reason they bite is when they are eating. You bite stuff too, right? Now, sometimes Tallulah mistakes my finger for a green bean. <laughs> it's my fault if I get them too close to her. So sure, she's accidentally nibbled on a finger before, but that's just part of my life. <laughs> Just a fun perk of the job, right? <laughs> um, Jaylene was curious, can, can you explain a little bit about um, what Tallulah is on right now, that, that climbing structure? Um, she's yeah. interested in her, her little structure that she's on. Uh, let's see if I can get it a little, I have too much stuff on the counter to get too close here, but there we go. So yeah, I made this for her and for other animals so that they could have a little bit of freedom when they're out here. So you can see them move naturally. Well, no, she's not moving very much because I have a little heater right here and she's very happy warming up her tush. So she's not moving, but I built this just out of logs so that you could see kind of naturally how she would move around. But yeah, she does have a big habitat in the back with plants and branches and places to hide and climb. She's got a pretty good life here. Yeah, she's a lucky lizard. <laughs> yeah, she is. Um, Masa and Finn were curious, are skinks cold-blooded animals? Yeah, you wanna take one, Justine? Yeah, so they are um, ectothermic and we do call it cold-blooded. That's not entirely what it means. Um, basically, these guys depend on their environment in order to regulate their body temperature. So uh, blue, for example, you see this rock that's in here with him. This uh, actually lives in his enclosure as well, and there's a heat lamp over it. So the rock gets nice and toasty warm. So if Blue feels like he needs to warm up, he climbs up on that rock and it lets him warm up. 
Um, Leslie out there with Tallulah, you heard her mention that there's a heat lamp out there with Tallulah as well. So they can choose where they need to go in order to regulate that body temperature. Whereas, you know, mammals like us, our body kind of does it for us, but they need a little bit of help. That makes sense. Uh, Zoe is curious, do any of our critters or the lizards that we have out here ever roam around the museum when people aren't around? <laughs> uh, certainly not blue. We'd never see him again. <laughs> I was going to say I would never catch him if I tried to let him. <laughs> but it is exciting for them to go to new places like, you know, Blue um, is in that little feeding habitat. He's been exploring it all morning. Uh, Tallulah here also has a place she can go outside for sunshine and exercise. We take her for walks. She's a little bit easier to find. <laughs> but yeah, she likes to go outside and climb trees and dig in the grass and leaves and pretend she's fossorial. That's super fun. Uh, Melanie and Zoe were wondering, do these animals make good pets? Um, you know, I don't, I don't usually say any animal makes a good pet uh, because I think people really need to do research and decide what animal fits in their lifestyle. Um, do you want to keep frozen mice in your house? That's someone who, um, you know, might be okay with having a snake around. Um, a, a girl like her needs a huge home and very specialized care. Um, she has a very special diet and we're always carefully looking at her teeth and body. So reptiles can be a lot of work. And yes, there's some easier reptiles and harder reptiles. She's one of the hardest. <laughs> so, um, so no, I don't think these particular ones are, are super easy. But lots of animals out there to rescue. I always recommend rescuing and not buying animals. Along with rescuing comes education oftentimes. That's awesome. Good to know. Um, okay, we have time for one more question. And lastly, and Justine, it's our question that I think you always answer in our uh -huh. presentations. So Rai and um, Alonzo were curious about what your favorite animal is or favorite <laughs> type of lizard, if maybe that's easier to narrow it down. Yeah. I answer it differently every time, I think. So don't go back and check other videos, okay? But today I'm going to say the Solomon Island skinks are my favorite. <laughs> They're so unique and cool. What about you, Justine? See, I'm going to say as far as our lizards go, Blue here is my favorite. Cool. Uh, he's our smallest by far, but also I feel like has one of the biggest personalities. You've heard us a couple of times call him a dragon, and that's because <laughs> he is a ferocious little hunter. One of my favorite things to do with him is just let crickets loose and let him actually hunt for him for them himself. So I like his spunky little attitude. I also love the little jump into the window when I get here in the morning. His little cute face is one of the first faces I see. So of the lizards, I'm going to say blue. Wow, we've got a star-studded <laughs> cast here today of our <laughs> <Yeah>. favorites. <laughs> well, thank you to Leslie, Justine, Blue, and Tallulah for being with us this morning. This has been so much fun. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, guys. I'm going to go ahead and close out our program for our students. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I know we had a lot of questions and not all of them got answered. So if you want to do a little bit of research on your own, I encourage you to jot down what your questions were and you or your parents and teachers maybe can do a little bit of research on skinks and lizards after our program. Um, if you want to learn more about our live animal program, you can always give them a follow on Instagram at NHMLA underscore live animals. You can also check out this recording and others of other animals we've met all throughout the school year on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash NHMLA. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.